Welcome. Uh, this is our first white paper circle and the topic for today will be on hybrid blockchain. And then we're going to take a uh, closer look at Zinfin directly, which is one of the leading uh, companies in trying to implement um, uh, hybrid blockchains. So let me just give you a quick overview of this um, presentation. Most of what we're going to be talking about is very high level. So if you guys have more questions at the end or during the presentation, please feel free to ask. Um, but we're going to be talking about what is hybrid blockchain first, some current projects that are trying to implement or use hybrid blockchain's ideas, or trying to implement the hybrid blockchain itself. And then we're going to look at more directly of Zinfin's overview of what they do and how it works. And then the, the purpose of having a hybrid blockchain in um, traditional standards, and then the business cases for it. And then we're going to finally take a look at what more of the technical side of how individually how the nodes work, how they interact with each other, and everything along that line. Cool, so let's begin. What is hybrid blockchain? So before we get into hybrid blockchain, we're just going to talk about public and private first. So public blockchain is the traditional Bitcoin, Ethereum network where anyone and everyone who wants to interact with the blockchain can join the uh, consensus protocol and maintain the um, shared ledger. And the reason why people would do, um, join these um, join public blockchain is mainly for the incentives to maintain or interact with the public blockchain. And in that case would be having a decentralized system or even just for the mining rewards itself. And the main concerns that come up with public blockchain is there's four things. So one is visibility. So data is all transparent on the public blockchain and everyone and every, anyone can see it. Next resource, proof of work is one of the main ways uh, public blockchains currently are being implemented and it's very expensive with all the technology required and then just the electricity and all of that. And then next thing is scalability. So for the most part, public blockchains are very hard to scale. One, because you're trying to keep a shared ledger between millions and millions of people. It's really hard to propagate that out, share it on, on there and confirm with everyone. So one, that is the um, consensus protocol, but two is just public blockchains are interacting with so many people and you're making sure that everyone has the correct consensus mechanism. And that just makes it very hard to scale. And the last thing is security. So most of the protocols on public blockchains, um, their security is basically the protocol and the consensus mechanism. And for the most part, they're not, none of them are perfect and it makes it so public blockchains are hard to make sure that you have is risk um, there's no risk involved with it and pretty much those are the concerns regarding public blockchains and now let's take a look at what private blockchains are so private blockchains are a bit more it, it's similar to public blockchains except that you are required an invitation for to join the network and inside that network is very permission based so you can customize how you want this um, network to interact with certain people or how it will interact in general. While it doesn't solve any of the public issues, it does um, provide a clear example of how it, you could solve it. So visibility with limited amount of people accessing the ledger, it's going to be less people. So only people you want to see will be able to see it and no one else. Resources and scalability doesn't really get that aren't really solved with the private blockchain idea because those two issues mainly come from alternative, like you need an alternative consensus mechanism to even try to solve resources and scalability. But scalability does, your, your consensus mechanism does um, directly relate to private blockchain because if you have a private blockchain that you, ha you have trust the people more likely, but you still want to use the blockchain idea. You likely don't need a full-fledged proof of work, proof of stake, something like that, um, consensus mechanism to ensure your information is correct for confirmation and such. So it does leave the consensus mechanism to make it much more simple, making resource and scalability um, decrease. Oh, it's resources decrease, but scalability is going to be able to increase much more easily. And finally, security relates back to visibility. With a limited amount of people interacting with it, you're able to um, make it so it's harder for malicious actor to act upon anything they want to do. So what is hybrid blockchain? It's pretty much offering the benefits of both public and private blockchains because there's obviously, um, you want to use a public blockchain because that's the decentralized idea. I mean, that's 
That's the main reason why anyone want to use blockchain. But you also want to use private blockchains because there's some information that doesn't need to be shared with everyone and any everyone on the network. It's just between you and the person that you're transacting with. And those stuff you can keep on the private blockchain. So if you wanted to visualize what a hybrid blockchain was, think about um, side chains. So you have a main chain and then you have multiple um, chains connected to that main chain. And the idea is that the public blockchain is the main chain where everything is connected to it, where you have private blockchains connected to that, public, that main public chain. But it doesn't have to be all public blockchains connected to the uh, main chain. It can be anything around it. And the goal of this is to have anything you need uh, kept on the private chain, on the private chain, and anytime you actually need to access the public chain, you're able to access it and only um, release information that is necessary on the public chain. So the purpose of this is mainly for enterprise-ready blockchains. And the idea is that, is that a lot of government, banking, global finance, and business have never even considered using blockchain because it's just not secure enough, um, all your data is released to, to the public for everyone and anyone to see, and it just makes it very hard for them to use blockchain um, technology, even though they might want to use the benefits of they might want to get the benefits of a blockchain. So what hybrid blockchain does is that it enables government and um, highly regulated enterprise that are unwillingly to use um, the public blockchain to be able to use a hybrid blockchain where they're able to have more flexibility of what they want to control in that network. And as a result, you're able to make it so these um, co companies that don't ever want to use blockchain are able to actually use blockchain and reap the benefits of blockchain while um, keeping their information and their security um, intact. So do you guys have any questions about hybrid blockchains to begin with? So I guess like when you're selling this idea to them, like what's the incentive for them choosing hybrid versus something that's private blockchain? Well, we, we're going to talk about more of the use cases in a bit, but like for example, if you keep everything on a private chain, private, private blockchain, right? Um, you still want to interact with other blockchains. So the goal is to make it so, the, the goal of hybrid blockchain is to have it connected to every single blockchain. So you're able to use one main chain, but you're able to have that main chain be connected to, let's say Bitcoin, Ripple, like all that is all connected. So the liquidity between everything is connected. That can't be done in a private chain because your private chains are going to be connected to only itself and nothing else. So if you want to interact with the public blockchain like Bitcoin itself, you won't be able to do that. So a hybrid blockchain lets you work with what you want to do in the private blockchain, but now you can actually interact with the public one. Yeah. So for example, if there's like a blockchain for identity, mm -hmm. then you'll be able to like connect that to like a yeah. hybrid central or centralized. Yeah, area. so like the main way I, I think about it is that, say I wanted to buy, I, I'm, a mar I'm in the market for radishes. We're going to be talking about that in a bit. So. Um, I don't want everyone to know that I'm like how much I paid for for these goods, right? But there's gonna be people in between me getting the um, goods. Um, there's gonna be multiple layers. So, for example, shipping is gonna be involved with me getting my goods. I don't need them to know how much I paid for um, these goods, and it makes it so a hybrid blockchain is able to connect with everyone in the system that you need to connect with, but only certain people will know certain activities that's gonna happen. Any other questions? Cool, so we're just gonna take a look at some current projects that's going on. And the main one I wanted to talk about first is um, Hi uh, Hyperledger's Fabric. And they're pretty much a enter enterprise blockchain platform with a permission network and confidential transaction. And the main thing that they're doing is that they're trying to implement the blo hybrid blockchain's idea onto a public blockchain. So their goal is to make it so it works, but they're not really implementing the hybrid blockchain itself. They're just trying to um, create a consensus protocol that works with, um, that w does the same thing as a um, hybrid blockchain. So before we continue talking about this, I'm gonna just show you this video. I think if you take a look at this video, you'll understand one, how hybrid blockchain works and more fluently and like the purpose of it. And then also just, um, what Hyperledger Fabric is doing and what most of these hybrid blockchains are trying to achieve.
Permission blockchain networks that require every peer to execute every transaction, maintain a ledger and run consensus can't scale very well. And they can't support true private transactions and confidential contracts. So the Hyperledger community designed Fabric V1 to deliver a truly modular, scalable and secure foundation for industrial blockchain solutions. The most notable change is that peers are now decoupled into two separate runtimes with three distinct roles, endorser, committer and consenter. Here's how it works. Say you run an organic market in California and I grow radishes on my farm in Chile. You and I are on a blockchain network that supports transactions between various markets, growers, shippers, banks, and others. Say I agree to sell you my radishes at a special low price, but I need the other markets that buy from me to continue buying at the standard price. They shouldn't be able to execute our confidential agreement and find out the details of our deal. In fact, if they aren't part of the deal, the transaction shouldn't appear on their ledger. Fabric V1 handles all this. My app looks up your identity from a membership service and then sends the transactions only to our peers. Both of our peers will generate a result. In this two-party agreement, the transaction requires both of us to render the same result. But in transactions with more parties, other rules can apply. Then the peers send the validated transaction back to the application which sends it to a consensus cloud for ordering. And then the ordered transactions are sent back to the peers and committed to the ledger. But to get my radishes to your market, there are many other parties involved. Some need to know that my radishes have been verified and checked into a shipping container. Others need to handle bills of lading, customs inspections, financing, insurance. But most of these parties don't need to know about our special price. Now think about our transaction running out of network handling all the markets, all the farms, shippers, facilitators, the whole supply chain. This is the same pattern needed by many industries. Anywhere we need to manage confidential obligations to each other without passing everything through a central authority. So that's the idea of this. So Really quick, let me just go over what like you guys just watched. So like pretty much like again like if you were to market and you were you were transacting with a radish farm, you would keep the amount right in your own ledger. But within each one, you also have to keep down your own ledger. But they don't need to know everything else, and that's what hybrid blockchain allows you to do because you're able to keep a private blockchain ledger, which is only you can see it and anyone else that you want them to see can see. And you're able to manipulate that with other people and it results in you being able to create a private blockchain that interacts with only certain people while releasing only information that's necessary for the public to see um, onto the public blockchain. And one of the other current projects that I looked at was Ripple and their idea, their technology is itself um, enterprise ready as well, but their main goal is not to um, implement a hybrid blockchain is more to implement hybrid blockchain ideas, which is mainly to become the standard in cross-border payments. So they're like the liquidity between um, most blockchains. In the Hyperledger example, who's your validator set for that radish transaction, right? Because you need to be able to yeah. have some consensus on that before it's sent to the public chain. So I don't think Hyperledger's fabric has like, I, don't, I haven't taken a look that much into like their consensus mechanism, okay. but- It's just PBFT. But yeah. I'm just curious as to like who the who the validators would actually be in this use case. Would it be other like radish producers? Would it yeah. Be? So the main issue with this would be like you re like I wouldn't I, I don't know exactly because the main issue of um, having validators like how do you actually ensure that the validators is um, releasing the right information in this? It's sort of like the supply chain idea. Like how do you know like within each bot that that validator is correct? And so I don't know exactly who would the validators be in this because you need to have the, to be trusted, but if you're on a private network, it's very hard for you to have a easy consensus mechanism where you're trusting everyone inside of it. Is it's, there, in a closed loop system, you do not necessarily need to have a PBFT since it's going to be still the winner set of participants, so it also comes with consensus like RAP, uh, in which you pretty much have uh, some of these uh, core uh, parties 
which which you can assign as leaders, and then they they are the validators essentially. Is there like staking at all? If like if, let's say I'm a uh, I lie. Yeah. Like obviously, like in proof of stake, you slash the guy yeah. who lies. Um, to disincentivize any kind of you know bad behavior. So. I mean, that's going to depend on like what type of consensus mechanism they would use in, in general first. Um, for Zinfin, the one we're going to be talking about mainly, um, the goal is to use a delegated proof of stake, which would, in sense, um, if they do, do live, would um, one remove them as a mas master node, which is very limited, the witnesses. And it would also remove their, it would also slash their um, tokens that they stake. So, um, yes, it would. Pretty much for your answer, okay. yeah. <clears throat> so these are current projects that we looked at in general, but the main one we want to talk about now is Zinfin, and the main reason we're looking at Zinfin is because it's the first um, hybrid blockchain that's actually implemented a full-fledged hybrid blockchain that works um, with a trade finance. So if you guys want to take a look at the white paper, it's tinyurl.com Zinfin paper. Um, you can also just go to their website, zinfin.org, to like take a look at all their, their information. So I'll let Atul talk about it. Um, really quick, Atul is the co one of the co-founders of Zinfin, and he has a really good understanding of what this, his project does, so I'm just going to let him talk about it for real quick. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to have you guys here. So Zinfin has, so Zinfin uh, actually stands for Exchange Infinite, uh, which what we envisioned as you know, if we build a network which you could interact with anything, we would be able to build an infinite exchange of values uh, between uh, decentralized networks as well as, you know, some of the centralized enterprise networks. Uh, but how do we do that, right? So we, as we spent, you know, more time, we realized some of these components were up for change, uh, while some of those were, you know, like especially the way the law system works, it's, it's very difficult to change laws or it's very difficult to change the way how fundamentally an enterprise would work. Uh, like, you know, uh, you carry a passport that, that's centralized, that usually represents a certain country. You cannot go out and say, hey, I have a decentralized passport. Uh, when you go and uh, go in a restaurant, you usually need someone to, you know, look after it. And <clears throat> when we are uh, really implementing, you know, a, a trade finance system, uh, in which there are so many uh, global parties interacting uh, with each other, uh, you and and from across geographies who have, uh, you know, their own jurisdictions, their own compliances in that region, but they are also dealing with uh, trust networks from, you know, across across the world where, uh, you know, they they need to have either a trustless or a trust network that they can uh, interoperate with, and that's that's where Zinfin uh, really, uh, you know, uh, was evolved after, after we spend uh, more time. Uh, in the industry. Uh, before Zinfin, I actually implemented one of the first production blockchain networks, uh, which is uh, live and in production right now. It, it, it is built on Hyperledger uh, Fabric. It uh, basically prevents fraud in trade finance. And while building that uh, system, we kind of realized it's, it's going to be a different game. Like if you set up a decentralized network and spin it off to master nodes, and speculators, that would be an ideal way to you know build a liquidity around it and build value around it. But how long would this network last? You know, I mean, you you really need uh, real stakeholders, real customers to run something to use it for uh, you know a value that is very mm -hmm. underlying in between. So that is what uh, that is what Zenfin is all about. Uh, we are actually going past uh, this approach. This this pretty much is before the, the Satoshi Times. Uh, this is pretty much before the Bitcoin white paper. And this is how systems pretty much looked before that. Uh, everything was just passing through one single point of contact or one single point of switch. And uh, that is something that uh, Bitcoin itself has disrupted to become more uh, decentralized. But even organizations, enterprises have now uh, you know, realized because most of the organizations, they are also across geographies. They also realized that uh, the whole central point of switching is no longer feasible. And that's where uh, when you say private blockchains, that is what you refer to as a distributed uh, network, which is run by enterprise across across geographies as well, which, which gives them a far uh, you know, bigger spread. Uh, 
I guess this was too short for any questions. Maybe after the next, are oh, you you have any questions? Uh, I was just going to ask who, generally speaking, hosts the nodes on these private chains. So these are so. I mean, just look at the way even two friends or three friends can go for a, a party, and it is quite possible that uh, you know two friends have things to talk about, and they they would not invite other you know other ones out there. Or if there are three of them, then they would have a different topic. So everyone has its a layer of abstraction or privacy from others and a, a private network is basically you know any two parties uh, meant to start with two uh, because one would be a very centralized one but starting with two anything can be a consortium a consortium chain or or a private network to, to start with that that's enough like even if you combine uh, you know two, two sufficiently large enterprise or uh, you know institutions that would still uh, be good enough to be a blockchain uh, to start with, but generally speaking, it's, so it's it's like because presumably you have different validator sets off these private chains who each need to have their own infrastructure to validate the chain itself. So do these private chains need to be able to install like AWS accounts and so forth to be able to validate? Which is a very good question. <clears throat> it depends. Uh, financial institutions generally have very very strict data privacy norms, mm -hmm. uh, which means you have to actually host uh, the data and servers in premises. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what also holds true for some of the very data intensive enterprises like uh, you know those would be maybe digital identities. I don't think you can have that kind of data on the AWS. So there's a limit on, uh, it, it usually is uh, you know written in the compliance and norms uh, uh, that and in the guidelines for that industry where you should host your data. If, if it is good enough to be on AWS, uh, it can stay there but uh, the private uh, network we are uh, we've, you actually accounted for that system where the data can be in premises as well. So, what what is the purpose of doing all this? What is the fundamental use case? You know, what is the fundamental value that uh, we are we are trying to disrupt? Uh, <clears throat> Every one of you uh, knows about Bitcoin. It was a white paper uh, released in two thousand eight. Uh, the whole white paper is very technical. Uh, if you read through it, you you'll see that yes, there is an element of uh, you know this this uh, digital cash network which can uh, you know which you can control your own uh, value with uh, with your private keys and it can work independent of any central switching uh, you know uh, network. Only after a, but the whole uh, timing of Bitcoin white paper release was very very business centric, which means that. You know, Bitcoin's white paper was released on 31st October 2008, and uh, it was 45 days after uh, Lehman Brothers' uh, bankruptcy, uh, and that was about 15th of September 2008. So, while the white paper itself is very technical, there was a strong fundamental business case attached to it. Uh, the group, uh, you know, that that wrote the that that the I'm I'm saying group because I I read. V in the very third line in the Bitcoin white paper. That's why I always call it call it a group, not an individual. So the the group really, you know, they they were very clear that the reason why a, a failure of this magnitude has happened because you know none of us are able to control our uh, our funds. We have to park it with someone. We have to if we have to make a payment, we have to send it uh, through someone. And as long as that is uh, going to happen. I'll never have control on how my capital is leveraged, whether it is over leveraged, whether it can, you know, fail. And just looking at the kind of volumes that actually happen uh, through through this centralized switching networks, it, it just made sense to even disrupt that market by even one percent. That would just uh, make you know Bitcoin as big as uh, uh, probably uh, what it is now, or you know maybe multiple times of that. So there was, there was a fundamental business case to this white paper. It was not just a technical white paper. The whole timing, uh, it was only until uh, Bitcoin was in existence for some time when people actually started realizing that, hey, there's a fundamental business case attached to it. And then when, then people started taking uh, you know, more, more exposure into it. Uh, then came Ethereum, uh, Ethereum of course, which, uh, which added the same consensus to uh, computing so now you don't have single computer processing your code uh, which you can just shut down you actually have multiple uh, computers who are executing the same code and even if you are tampering with uh, one of those the the code would still execute 
uh, which means that uh, there is uh, inherently a law system in that, uh, which is which is kind of coded. Uh, it was branded as a world computer. Uh, although the, the the point for putting this slide in is that the the real business case, the success for Ethereum, actually did not come from computing itself because it would be a awful and slow computer if you really want to use it for your day-to-day -day purpose. Uh, where it actually derived its business case from? Okay, so uh, the, the real growth of Ethereum started uh, coming in when there was an ERC-20 standard developed on it, uh, which was an actual existing market of crowdfunding. So if you look at uh, some of the growth charts or reports for crowdfunding, even before Ethereum came into existence, there was a crowdfunding and microfinance market which was growing at almost 150 or 200 percent every year uh, before ERC-20 came in. And it just provided a platform for uh, decentralized capital raising and exchange through uh, Ethereum. So that, that was the whole uh, you know, business case why, why Ethereum has, has grown in value. Um, this, this is how it, uh, the market stands today. Uh, there was 2008 after which Bitcoin was started, uh, which, you know, which basically, uh, you know, a lot of funds were written off, written off because they were basically over leveraged by some financial institutions, and and the magnitude of this shock was was so intense that the whole global market felt uh, the you know the, the shock. This this what happened in 2018. This was extreme decentralization where uh, stuff just went out of control so much that eventually. Uh, you know, some of the mainstream systems just cut liquidity to it. Uh, China cut the liquidity into, into uh, decentralized markets. India cut it there. If you if you look at, you know, if someone wants to operate an actual fiat exchange, that is no longer really, uh, you know, allowed except for very very strict uh, jurisdictions where Japan is. And <clears throat> the the point of 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 showing this that extreme centralization is you know it's as bad as bad as extreme decentralization would both these markets essentially have to coexist in some way uh, you cannot just go and vouch for extreme decentralization in everything because that would mean chaos while extreme centralization is already is also you know has has proven itself to be a chaos uh, this is this is the reason why you actually need a blockchain platform that can actually coexist with both both of these economies uh, so that you can actually make uh, use of the, both, uh, the the best of uh, both worlds, and you know give deliver real value to, to the people uh, who are who are actually beginning to use it. So what was what is the purpose of uh, Zinfin? These are some of the markets we are looking at. These are massive massive markets, and these are essentially markets which have a lot of cross border uh, money transmission, trust network, law systems, paperwork. Uh, remittances. These are these are trillions of markets, and currently, if you look at, is is the blockchain or existing crypto uh, project solving any of these? The answer is no. Uh, I think maybe settlement and forex market is is somewhat, but uh, if you really look at uh, at an enterprise scale, institution scale, if anyone is solving these problems, no, because the reason is that these markets are still very very enterprise heavy. They're still uh, very uh, you know uh, they they operate in a very central environment, and that is why blockchain would perfectly fit uh, the use case for some of these markets if if it is the right block blockchain platform and right blockchain structure. So uh, this is the reason why uh, Zinfin has uh, you know come into existence. We are actually past the white paper stage. We are. Uh, pretty much a platform in alpha right now, transitioning into beta and eventually production around Q1 2019. Uh, while Alan will deep dive into uh, the technical aspects of it in the uh, later slides, uh, this is this is how uh, it it looks like right now. It, uh, you know there are uh, a few applications that are already built on it, and we are actually we have some of our partners who are actually making it work in the enterprise environment so that you don't create a very generalized system for people to have their own silo kind of developments, but you 
you know, you actually make something work in the in the real environment. And how that is happening is uh, through uh, Alpha X, which is basically an exchange platform by, which uh, builds these hybrid relays. We'll deep dive into that uh, in the later slides. And Tredfinex, which is actually secured a, a sandbox uh, license in UAE and shortly in four other jurisdictions, where you can actually uh, trial this, uh, these transactions in a real enterprise environment. Any, any questions? Well, so I'm just going to finish up the presentation with understanding of sort of more of the technical side of all the nodes, how, how the validation is going on. So really quick, let's just take a look at what a visualization of the Zinfin network looks like. So you're going to have a master node that's connected to multiple different sections. So you have network one connected to the master node and also network two connected to the master node. While network one can communicate with each other privately, network two can never see what they're actually doing. Unless they want to present something to the public blockchain, which all of them do have a ledger to, network one can keep anything that they want to keep private, private. And network two can also do the same thing because they have their own private um, ledger inside of their um, node. And, the, and pretty much what's going on here is that they're all able to communicate with each other through a relay bridge, but they're also able to only communicate with each other on certain items that they want to keep track of. If they wanted to keep anything else um, private, they will keep it on their on the private ledger and private chain. So if you read the whole white paper, a visualization that I sort of drew up, honestly, like this is what you're pretty much um, doing in the end. So your blue chain, the blue chain right here is your XCC public network, right? So each one of these are gonna be master nodes and connecting to each of these other private chain or public chain, you're able to communicate from the red chain to the purple chain using the blue chain as a medium without them ever even con being connected. So in a larger scale, Zinfin is technology and hybrid, hybrid blockchain technology is to be able to connect every single blockchain together and have a relay chain between all of them so they can all talk to communicate and transfer to each other without ever really being connected to each other at once. And the way to understand this visualization is that master, master node 11 right there and K11 over here in the uh, red chain, they're the same person or same node. And as a result, they are able to really relay back and forth because they're in the same node and all the information are contained in the same in that same node. And as a result, if K4 down there wanted to communicate with P8, it would all all it had to do was communicate first with um, one of the master nodes that um, that are on the red chain, which is K11 or K1. Then when they get back to the um, public network they can communicate to each other, the master nodes can communicate with each other. And because um, K4 wants to communicate with P8, but I communicate back to M3 and M4, and as a result, they are the same as P1 and P2, and you're able to communicate with P8 now. And that's the whole idea of hybrid blockchain and um, Zinfin itself, is just to make sure that all the communication between every single blockchain is able to um, flow very um, smoothly between everything. So the way co the Zinfin's consensus protocol work is delegated proof of stake. And to understand what delegated proof of stake is, we first gonna break it up. So delegated part, the idea is that you're gonna have a technological democracy. So there's, a, there's validators called witnesses where they get paid for validating blocks, but there's only a limited amount of pe um, people that can be witnesses, and this is gonna be dependent on how much they wanna stake. And the purpose of using a delegated, the delegated part is to make it so it's scalable. Proof of um, stake currently does work, but it makes it very hard for it to scale because there's so many more um, people trying to stake and get um, voting powers, right? As a result, you're able to limit that amount of people to only a set amount, and you're also able to make it so it's very hard to be malicious because um, you are voting to either keep them as a witness or not. And the way Zinfin is going to be using this is going to be mainly keep this as their protocol in their um, in the blue chain, making it so all the master nodes currently on the blue chain 
has to be delegated up to a master node and has to um, be able to communicate with these um, chains itself. And again, that's gonna all um, work with, yes? I just had a question, how are K11 in the pass diagram and like K1 selected? And then like what happens if K1 over 11 is malicious? Yeah, do you wanna talk about how like uh, master nodes are picked? Yeah, so it, it basically starts with uh, staking uh, your tokens and running, running these uh, relay bridges, mm -hmm. uh, which is how you have to actually configure it from here. So it doesn't get configured from the public chain. You actually have to configure it from, from these chains. So these, while there are uh, going to be, uh, we are actually releasing some of these relay bridges for the Bitcoin, XRP, and uh, Ethereum network itself. Uh, the way the private networks are set up, like consortium, blockchains, or even legacy systems, uh, they can actually configure it in their own way. Uh, how they do it is, so any interaction is still, you know, it's still staked by your native fuel, which gives, which prevents any, you know, which, which has the same kind of uh, checks that uh, is, that you observe when uh, any malicious actor is, you know, kind of trying to breach the network. So it is observed with the same kind of governance and rules. Okay, so like K11 or K1 are like elected operators. And then the other question is how do K11 and K1 get into the role of master node if they're like, if presumably you scale beyond 11 consortiums? Uh, this one? So yeah, or this one or, you're or saying here? K11 and like, is it M11? Or M11, M11 yeah. Is, yeah. Are, yeah. are the same person, yeah. generally speaking? So then do you have like a master node set that scales linearly with the amount of consortium chains if each of those properties are linear? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we are actually, because it's a, it's a deposit where, uh, you know, the, the number of active master nodes, mm -hmm. our validators are actually going to be restricted. So you, you can, you know, still, still have the scaled up uh, network. Uh, but you don't, even if, so there, there's, a, uh, there's a purpose of having a standby validators. So it kind of grants you the same status of being the validator itself, okay. and uh, that pretty much lets you do the transactions uh, on on this on this network as well. Okay, so uh, I guess like the last question then is: so let's say you get to twelve consortium chains and there's eleven main main master nodes. How do you stop any of those master nodes from censoring that valid that like that consortium chain if they choose to? Because you no longer have a role in. Uh, are you talking about uh, here in the public chain? Okay. Yeah, so imagine like 12 of those circles around the core blue circle, yeah. and there's only 11 core master nodes. Yeah. What happens with the 12th network? Like how do you stop the 12th network from becoming censored if it's just reliant on communication with one node that's not itself? Um, can M3 be both P1 and K8? Can it have a role in multiple but, consortiums? Yeah, MC, so MC can be P1 uh, only at, at because that is the way it is configured. So there is so our uh, bridge is actually in alpha right now. We are actually going to be releasing it on on GitHub uh, around uh, by by this month and or or okay. early uh, early next uh, early next month. So right now the relay bridges have uh, been configured to do basic uh, you know basic of these uh, relays. And so that the, the private network, when uh, when the transactions flow on from here to here, that is something that you can relay on the public chain. Eventually, you can. Uh, you, we are building a relay bridge which which does the both way transfers. But this is this something this is going to evolve. So one of our approach is not to have, you know, an entire system in production because this is what an ideal system looks like. But have real. Uh, you know, relay bridges uh, in in production, which are you know live, that uh, live to to do actual transactions. One of the advantages that we have because of the DPoS is that we do have rapid upgradability, and we are kind of uh, you know counting on the fact that you don't need to have a, a full like a perfect. There's nothing like a perfect network, and you restrict the upgradability uh, by trying to be a perfect network upfront. So that is why it has to evolve, and this is this is what the DPoS network eventually uh, does let you do that. Uh, so some of these functionalities of having a K1 uh, actually relay with uh, P2 also, this is something that we will be releasing across 
uh, you know, as, as we stabilize the, the production networks in this first. Because these, these themselves are actually going to carry immense value uh, uh, in themselves. Okay, sure, sounds good. Yeah. Are there different layers of privacy within these networks, as we get like, especially with the cloud network itself? That's all honestly going to depend on their, the network itself. So like, if you look at it broadly, the only thing Zinfin really controls is the blue chain. Everything else in these chains have their own consensus mechanism, has their own um, permission base, whatever they have, whatever they want to do. Oops. So if you wanted to make like, for example, the red chain very like a lot more private with only like a selected amount of people in it, like only five people in it, it's up to the red chain for them to do that. And then what the main thing what Zinfin is trying to do is just connect all these private chains together so they have a way to communicate with each other if necessary. And does that answer your question, first of all? Yeah, sorry. I mean, I guess I was still thinking this within the net, the red chain, are there yeah. different levels of privacy within that, right? Like some mm. people have some information or access to some information like us. So are you trying to say, like, uh, even make it more like, yeah. uh, like, hmm. I'm not sure exactly how that part would be implemented because that wouldn't be directly, uh, that would be like a idea of just um, a blockchain with multiple different type levels of permission. So that's not directly hybrid blockchain, it's more of a different idea now. But regarding that, it's, I don't think it's impossible to do, but I think it requires, again, like multiple blockchains. Like if you're gonna have a red chain with different levels, right? Maybe that red chain is also connected to another level, another blockchain which has even more privacy, like private, which only takes in a couple of these nodes together. Mm -hmm. So my idea of it would be like another blockchain connected to this one. Because you're really limited on what you can do within your blockchain because it's all within that one consensus mechanism and creating multiple levels of it in the same blockchain is very difficult. Yeah, so just to uh, some, like, finalize like what this image is, it's pretty much the goal of this is honestly to make sure that that red chain, if you ever wanted to keep it private, stays private. And as a result, you only need to, one, disclose anything you need to public chain whenever you need to. But two, also, you don't need to ever put all your finance or all your, um, the amount you own in whatever coin onto the blue chain. And, and you can only put, you can put a proportion of it that you actually need to interact with. So it just gives you a lot more flexibility in general and gives you a lot more control to yourself, making it work actually in an enterprise level. And for the final thing is just the implementation of um, delegated proof of stake is not gonna be exactly the same on Zinfin. So what we're trying to do in the future is we're trying to, we're gonna be working with the parity team to work with their idea and implement it to what um, BitShares and other companies have done with um, delegated proof of state and combine those ideas together to make it a more of a, um, relying on pretty much the relay channels and the payment channels and make sure all of that is able to be connected in a fluent uh, way. So the liquidity between all the blockchains are very smooth. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. Um, so basically, Zenfin is just like interoperability for consortia as well. In sense, yeah. So um, one of the uh, you know one of the purpose uh, when we set up when I was presenting the what is the purpose of Zenfin slide? <clears throat> the whole liquidity in in markets is still it still lies the, the trillions still lie there with institutional and enterprise markets, right? So unless that liquidity, there's a way for that liquidity to come in and being transacted uh, in, in the blockchain or decentralized markets, the blockchains cannot really scale up in terms of value, right? The blockchain will, blockchain itself is not a market. Blockchain, if blockchain itself was a market, uh, that would be, yeah, you know, and a very small market to deal with because it, the, what you see on coin market cap is not, not really the volume that's, that's actually there, you know, it's, it's a lot of leverage volume out there. So for making blockchain itself more valuable, there is it is so important for you to be liquid enough against anything. So Exchange Infinite is actually, that is the purpose of uh, having uh, Zenfin is to be interoperable and liquid with central as well as decentralized protocols. So 
So why do why do like consortium blockchains need to be connected? It is because if you look at some of these uh, use cases that we did present, uh, if you look at asset tokenization as a market, imagine uh, there's this this building, this real estate, which is uh, probably owned by you know some some asset manager, and they want it to be more liquid. They want to de-risk themselves if if they need, and uh, they cannot open it up in Berkeley or in US itself. Uh, the uh, the real estate investment laws in this country allow anyone from international market to come and enter and have have like uh, you know fractions or share of this property as well. Now, how would you actually make this kind of asset to be more liquid while it's being secure and still uh, you know running in the enterprise environment? You can make it more liquid by connecting to other other markets, right? That is the whole purpose of uh, the liquidity channels with any kind of system because then you can make uh, this. A real estate or a, or a you know a physical property or or actual something which has an underlying asset value to be more liquid across any markets. Sure. So let's say let's say we do have like a tokenized real estate um, that is centralized. Let's say. Yeah. Um, in in that previous diagram, it's just one node. In that there's no like consortium there. It's not even a blockchain. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a blockchain actually. Yeah. If you want to interoperate with it, it doesn't have to be a blockchain. You can still still have the relay bridge with even existing systems. Okay. And does that at that stage? So exactly. That this is this is why the design is like this. That uh, whoever is so firstly the relay bridges are each of these components have to have uh, their level of compliance. And you know approval regulations uh, laws around them. If you are talking about the relay bridges, this is these are the exchange of values across borders, which means that you need to have money services, uh, business license for these kind of businesses to run the run the relay bridge. You know bridges. This can be existing financial institutions, approved fintech companies, someone like Coinbase. You know uh, these these kind of uh, entities. So they look at regulation from their own way. We just want to give them uh, a, a protocol which is interoperable enough. Uh, for this, so we don't want to. How uh, we have actually gone in and secured uh, a, a couple of uh, Reglab licenses ourselves, but that is really to demonstrate system to a to a wide network of people. But eventually, compliance will be handled by uh, you know entities which are actually going to transact the value through it. Yeah. Um, and maybe I don't know if we're still working on the architecture. Like, are, how many nodes are in your? In in your DP, in DPoS, so our DPoS is actually going on testnet uh, around uh, next month. So we have eventually uh, kept a provision for hundred of uh, the validators, active validators, at any point of time. But the stand standby validators can be as many as possible. Uh, the the point is that if hundred of the active validators, any of those misbehave or something, then you can choose from the standby list, and everyone will have their own reward system linked to it. Sure. And. So is there a so there's a token like a is there a negative yeah token? yeah yeah so uh, the token is called Zinfin Digital Contract XDC and uh, we actually are live on Coin Market Cap right now but it's not uh, not with this token it's an atomic swap with the ERC twenty called XDCE uh, which is which is live and liquid okay nice. and this is this is where we are actually doing some of these transactions and then so this XDC would be used to stake yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the security model? Um, I'm just curious what happens, so like you said that there's like 100 DPoS nodes. What happens when you get like 101 relay chains? Um, how is that 101st person communicating with the DPoS uh, network? Like it, it presumably, uh, I thought the example earlier was just saying, uh, I have a node that I'm running on my consortium chain and a node that I'm running on the DPoS chain. So what happens when you hit that 100? Yeah, so that doesn't have to be an active validator. It okay. can be just another node in the system. It just needs access to the liquidity from that network. Got it. Got doesn't it. have to be an active validator. I see. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, so I mean, for the most part, that's pretty much it for our presentation. We're going to be sticking around for like a good 30 minutes or however long to just, if you guys have any personal questions or um, want to talk more to us about like what we are doing because 
the slide itself, we weren't sure the audience, so we made it very high level and very, um, pretty much very high level. But there's a lot more to talk about, honestly, about this, uh, about Zenfin and hybrid blockchain itself. Like for one, if you guys want to take a look at the entire um, Zenfin white paper right now, they do have an ar um, ar architecture section, which, which is honestly is very um, complex and a lot more, <coughs> answers a lot of the questions you guys might have right now and explains like how the administration works and um, how to make like different types of manager positions within the each nodes. And so definitely take a look at the white paper if you're interested in more of that. But if you guys have more questions, just come up and just talk to us. Yeah. Oh. All right. So uh, yes, we are, uh, we are actually hiring here in the, here in the Bay Area. Uh, this is, uh, we feel for uh, the interesting thing about blockchain is that if you look at Ripple, Ripple is right there in San Francisco. It has an actual client in uh, London and its liquidity if you look in coin market care actually comes from the Asian markets. And that's actually proof for blockchain that you cannot uh, drive a, a successful blockchain from one region. You need the best from uh, both from, from all, all parts of the ecosystem. And since Bay Area has its own uh, tech vibes and all you know all, all the structured thinking around tech and it has been proven uh, we are actually expanding our tech team here we were originally uh, based in uh, singapore we have teams in singapore india uae uh, london uh, some in east coast but uh, we are actually actively setting up our tech sector tech sector here in the bay area to to work with the you know best minds uh, that are out there so uh, feel free to write to us and we'll uh, we'll, we'll explore uh, how we can take it forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>